the first hadith is about men towards women and the second one is about women towards men. The first hadith is from uh, Abu Huraira radiallahu and it's muttafaqun alayh which means it's related in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim which means it's the soundest form of hadith outside of what's called mutawatir uh, which is multiply transmitted to the point where it's impossible that it could have been uh, a lie or some mistake in it. Uh, and this hadith says, Tunkahul Maratu li Arbain. A woman is married for four reasons. Limaliha. The first reason is wealth. So there are people that marry for wealth. And very common. Wealthy people tend to like to marry wealthy people. And there's a number of reasons for that. And that's certainly acceptable in Islam. There's nothing against that. I mean, it's just an acceptable thing. It's not encouraged by, or anything, but it's acceptable. And some of the ulama consider, scholars consider, that wealth is a type of kafa'a, that it's good for somebody from one socioeconomic class to marry somebody from a similar socioeconomic class because uh, if somebody was raised with a certain level uh, of opulence or a certain level of standard of living and then they marry considerably under that, that can be quite traumatic for that person uh, and it can lead to problems. And that often happens when people marry for love, uh, like a romantic type of love. Uh, so wealth generally in Islam is property and liquid assets and liquidity that you have capital. I mean, that's wealth. So the, the first is for wealth. The second is for what's called uh, hasab. Li hasabiha. Hasab, there are two concepts in, in, in Arabic. Nesab and hasab. Nesab is your lineage. It's who you come from. So it would be either your, your clan in Arabia or your family in uh, in in most other places. So, generally lineage, but in, in the Shafi'i Madhab, he considers lineage to be a valid uh, reason uh, for refusing uh, somebody in marriage. Imam Malik does not. So these are ishtihadat uh, that the ulama differed about. And uh, lineage is certainly like in certain communities, like for instance, uh, in some Arabic communities, also for instance, in a Somali community. You know, Somalis have, I mean, there, there are Somalis that they can take their lineage of marriage back like 30 generations. And so if you marry outside of the, that clan and you marry another clan, it's considered a calamity, right? So those things here in America should not be real considerations for us. Those are, I think, problems in the Muslim world. But good family uh, does have meaning. So you can look at Nesab as just what good families are. And good families, just like uh, in the non-Muslim culture here, there are families that have uh, good character, uh, generosity, uh, religious. Now Hasab, and there's different riwayah about this, but Hasab is what your ancestors have done that, that distinguish you. So for instance, if you're related to somebody great in history, then that's part of your hasab. So if somebody's uh, ancestor was a king or, or an ancestor was a great writer, like if, if you're the son or daughter of uh, T.S. Eliot, right, who was a great poet, uh, then that's a hasab. Because people who know Eliot, they're going to be, oh, really, you're his grandson or his grand... It, all, it strikes an interest just automatically. That's what hasab is. It gives you a type of standing amongst people because of distinguishing characteristics of your ancestors. So there's, there's a natural inclination in the human heart to children of great people. It's just something that Allah has put. And that's what marrying for hasab is. It's like, oh, I really want to marry this person. Why? Well their great-grandfather was such and such. I mean, that's, it's like an honor to be in that, you see. So that's hasab. And then li jamaliha, for her beauty. 
you marry them for their physical appearance. And then the last one is Lidiniha. And then the Prophet said, and Deen here means, I mean, I would interpret this not necessarily as, especially in our time, not necessarily as religiosity or some of the outward trappings that people view as religious. Um, because you can go into some cultures where all the outward religiosity aspects are there. I would see this more as uh, the person who is aware of the nature of the world. That they're actually not oriented towards the dunya. They're oriented towards the akhirah. And that can translate in a lot of different ways. Because the, the nature of a person who has deen is that they're not worldly by nature. That their desire is not the accumulation of stuff. It's the accumulation of good actions. And that can translate in a lot of ways. So uh, you can see people that, that have that. I mean, it might not be as black and white as people would like to think. And so you have to be careful about that. Because uh, you can marry somebody that looks outwardly, the package looks all right. But then you find out, you know, it's all about bangles and, you know, the, it's all, it's some real dunyawi orientation. And then you can see somebody else, the package might not look there, but the internal reality of the person is, is that they are oriented towards the akhirah. So you have to be aware of that. Uh, but the Prophet ﷺ did say, Fadfar bidat al-deen taribat yadak. Fadfar, uh, dhafar means like to gain, you know, to take the prize, you know, to, you know, seize the one who has deen. Taribat yadak. It means like, may your hands be filled with dust which the Arabs use it to the opposite meaning, and you'll be successful. Now the idea here is that if you look at those three things, uh, if you look at the first one, which is wealth, wealth can, can be lost. Right? So somebody might be wealthy today, they had all their money in stock market, and then the next day they don't have anything. So is your love still there? Because if you married them for that reason and they lose that thing, then the reason that you were attracted to that person is no longer there, so maybe the attraction won't be there anymore. The same is true of hasab. Hasab is about fathers and ancestors. It's not about that person. So after you marry that person, the initial interest, you know, suddenly you have to deal with the fact maybe this person isn't a good person. Maybe their father or their grandfather was a good person, but they're not a good person. They're a horrible person. And so all that's left is for you to go around, well, at least she's the daughter of so-and-so, you know. I mean, that's, that's what you're stuck with. <laughs> Which might not be the best uh, grounds for a good marriage. And then, finally, beauty. I mean, beauty, one, initial attractions. If, you, if you're seeing a person every day, you start losing that you know, the first attraction of beauty, right? So you get used to a person, and, that, and that's something very common. So you're attracted to somebody for outward reasons initially, but again, you might lose the appreciation. That The, the first thing, it be, just becomes something that you get used to seeing, and then you see them because people can look very beautiful, but when you live with them, uh, you see their bad days, Right? And suddenly, you know, the ephemeral nature of beauty, which, you know, people can look really bad. Even beautiful people can look really bad on a bad day. And, and the face is strange in that it's very malleable. It's, it's very, uh, and as you get older, it gets more, you know, you can really see differences. So if that's the reason you married a person, you're going to start, the eye will start wandering and, and, you start being attracted to uh, other sources of beauty. So again, those three are all ephemeral reasons. And what the Prophet is saying, marry somebody for something that lasts, not for something that doesn't last. And the only thing that lasts is the deen. I mean, that is what lasts. And that's why you should marry a person, for what lasts. And he said, if you do that, you'll be successful in your marriage. And if you do it for those other reasons, it's not a guarantee of success. I mean, maybe it will become a successful marriage, but 
blame yourself if it's not. But if you married somebody on a strong foundation, because the beauty of Islam is that marriages really can be worked out if we adhere to first principles in our deen, rights and responsibilities, because usually things can be sorted out. If somebody's not doing something according uh, to the deen, then if, if there's somebody of deen and it's pointed out to them, they have to respond. Right? The onus is on them. So the idea of marrying not just for deen but khuluq, of looking into the character of this person, and one of the things is to get them angry and see how they react.